On the Healthy Human Revolution podcast, Dr. Lori Marbus interviews nutrition and lifestyle medicine experts and extraordinary guests whose informative and inspiring stories will empower you with the knowledge to transform your life and health. Welcome to the podcast. I'm Dr. Lori Marbus, and today I'm excited to welcome not only an amazing guest, but a friend, Ella Stevens. How are you? I'm doing great, Lori. Thank you for having me. <laughs> Well, this will be from the Netherlands. Yes, you join us from the well. You you have an interesting accent. The first time I met you, I was like, "Wow, there's there's a world here in this accent." <laughs> we'll get that to that. True. We yes, and we'll get to that story in a second. But uh, Ella and I met last fall when we went to North Carolina to film a documentary with Plant Pierce. So it's very fun. But we're here to talk more about Ella's personal story, which is really cool. So, Ella, you want to tell us a little bit about your history and type one diabetes? Yeah. So I was 15 years old when I was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes, and it took a few years to understand the impact that nutrition and exercise had on my day-to-day -day maintenance. But uh, yeah, in 2014, I was then going to the gym. I noticed how much it was impacting my blood sugars. Then I started incorporating eating different foods and I came across the China study later that year, and after reading Dr. Campbell's book, it was very clear to me that I needed to cut out animal protein from my diet and give that a go. Uh, I created my own little science experiment at home, monitoring my blood sugars and how much insulin I was taking. And so in 2015, I adopted a whole food plant-based diet and just watched my life change dramatically in, in a matter of weeks. Let's go back a little bit. So you just kind of skipped over like a decade. So let's, <laughs> so let's talk about, you know, even life as a teenager being diagnosed with type one diabetes. So what was that like? And what was your story? Like, what were the symptoms that you developed and how did it be, how did it actually get diagnosed? Yeah. So I was living in Australia at the time where I'm originally from. Part one of the um, accent. Yes. Part one, yes. <laughs> and uh, Unfortunately, in the, the annual doctor's visits you had, they didn't do a blood glucose finger prick test like they do here in the US. So we were not clued on to that something was wrong with my blood sugars. And so I was quite sick for, well, the doctors estimated about six months I was sick, mm. but it, it got to the point where I couldn't walk up a flight of stairs without needing to sit down. Uh, I had no energy to do anything. I was needing to skip sports practice after school. I did really poorly on exams that I had, like my midterm exams, which was uncharacteristic of me. Uh, so pieces were there that something was wrong, but the tipping point was I got oral thrush in my mouth um, from just too much sugar in my blood. And that's what then brought me to the doctors. And it, it took them three days for them to tell us that then I had type one diabetes. And I went and spent six days in the emergency room or in the ICU, um, recovering from that, getting, yeah, just getting more stable. So it was hard at 15. Why did it take three days for them to tell you you're type one? I mean, your blood sugars must've been through the roof. Yeah, they didn't, uh, they didn't test them at the appointment, whatever they did it. I remember, well, it was a Wednesday and then it was uh, Wednesday. I had the appointment and Friday, then I was, needed to go to the hospital straight away after school. Uh, interesting. So it was just a slow process. Yeah. Uh, and it was a matter of, they either said, okay, well, I have some sort of cancer, kidney failure, or type one diabetes was like, or those were the options actually that my mom found online when she looked at my symptoms. And she says she knew immediately that then it was type one diabetes. And then the doctor confirmed it the next day. Uh, so yeah, it took a, it took a little bit of time and I was also drinking a lot of juice, eating a lot of pineapple. Mm. Um, and even my friends at school commented on how I could eat so much food yet. It seemed like I just kept losing weight and they, you know, were 15 year old girls and everyone's really worried about their body image. And so they, they had noticed that part of it, but no one put all these pieces together and yeah, so it took some time, um, and then I was yeah, starving when I was in the ICU. I remember eating eight sandwiches the next day and about five yogurts and <laughs> a lot of fruit. Um, but they were so much better once everything got settled out. 
yeah, got some insulin in my system. And <laughs> <laughs> they hooked me up to an IV. And I remember the, the nurse told me, well, she told me I was a month away from death, which was mm -hmm. a confronting thing to hear. And she was also surprised I wasn't vomiting up blood because my blood was very acidic at the time. So I was sick. Wow. Yeah. You were handling a, a very severe illness for some time. That's amazing that, geez, okay, it's astounding. Yeah. So what happened in that ICU? Because now you're going from a teenager who was well, went through this sick period, and now you have this diagnosis, and you're saying, someone's telling you you're going to be injecting insulin for the rest of your life. What is that going on in a young teenager's mind? Yeah, well, I am a very strong-willed, determined person, so I actually did not even want the nurses to give me my insulin. I wanted to do it from the beginning. They said I was the first pediatric patient that was so determined to do their own insulin. Uh, so I did my first injection the next day. They gave me insulin through the IV the night before. Uh, so I got right on to it. Um, but yeah, it was life-changing. Definitely. You know, my friends are starting to go out and party and have their teenage fun. And then to me, it just felt like, oh, well, my whole life is turned around as I know it. And mm -hmm. I needed to reorganize my priorities. And luckily from a very young age, I, or it clicked with me that I really needed to take care of myself now. So mm -hmm. I would live a healthy life when I was older. Right. Um, and I know I've worked with people with type 1 diabetes before who really struggled to get a grip on it and manage the disease and luckily that wasn't me I was then very determined to do what I needed to do so I wouldn't be losing limbs or my eyesight uh, when I was older yeah absolutely yeah. so now you you went through your life and through high school and was able to continue sports I know you're very active we'll get to all that too in a minute um and as you entered into, so you found the China study, what made you begin searching for the China study or like, how did that actual evolution occur? Yeah. So it was my sophomore year at college. Oh, no. So it was my freshman year at college and second semester, I, I had put on weight with the classic freshman 15. And that's what really actually led me to start going to the gym more and start caring about what I was eating. So that's when I started noticing the impacts that nutrition was having on my body. And it was my dad actually went to his primary care doctor and he was, or he is a bit more alternative or holistic for uh, primary care doctor. And so my dad asked and said, my daughter's really uh, interested in nutrition. She has type one diabetes. Is there a book or any books or information you would recommend that she look into? And so he was the one who mentioned the China study, which I am forever thankful to him, to my dad and the doctor for, yeah, bringing the China study into our lives. My dad ordered it that day online and it was shipped mm -hmm. to our house. My dad actually read the book before I finished it. And so we were kind of on this journey together. He then also ordered like 10 copies and sent it to all our friends and family because we really were just like, this is life changing. Like it makes sense. It's incredible we were on board. So we then, yeah, started making dietary changes. And then I transferred to Cornell University, inspired by Dr. T. Colin Campbell. And it was when I transferred there in September of 2015, that I then just made the complete switch and was completely whole food plant based, um, which was great. There was actually quite a big vegan community at Cornell. And yeah, I met some really nice, friends who were also on a similar journey and who were very yeah determined to incorporate plant-based eating more into our life into our university and to, to teach other people about it so that's that's where my plant-based journey began okay so now let's see you were in Australia uh, at diagnosis yeah and then when did you come to the U.S. or tell tell us a little bit about your U.S. Australia journey yeah, so, well, so I was born in Sydney, Australia, and we moved to Boston in the US when I was six years old for the first time. And then flash forward a couple of years, I was then uh, 15 when I was diagnosed in Australia. So we moved back to Australia in 2007. I was diagnosed with diabetes in 2009. 
And then just four months later, January 2010, we moved back to Boston. So that was a very difficult time, having just been diagnosed and then needing to move countries again. And we moved, yeah, back to Boston. And that's now where we've lived since 2010. Well, you also went off to the Netherlands for more schooling, but we'll get to that in a second. <laughs> so everyone can understand now where I'm hearing when I first met, I was like, I'm not quite sure where to ask where she's from, because I like to try to identify mm -hmm. <laughs> having married someone. Well, I mean, Pat was born in the U.S., but, you know, obviously uh, just the accents are fascinating to me. So, um, OK, so now we're in the U.S. and it's 2010 and then you went off to college, you transferred to Cornell. And what were your studies there? Because I think that's kind of an interesting thing, because this this impacted your entire career, so to speak. Yeah, so I, uh, I first went to the University of Vermont for my bachelor's and I was studying biochemistry. So I've always been science oriented. Uh, I loved chemistry and then biochemistry was what I picked as my major going into freshman year. And then I actually decided to take a gap year. So I finished two years and then felt like I didn't know what I was doing with my life. I didn't know why I was working so hard. What was I gonna do when I graduated college? So I took a year off to figure that out. And that's when I, I worked with my diabetes hospital, Joslin Diabetes Center in Boston. I worked there for six months and I traveled and that's the year I read the China study. So then it was clear to me, I'll transfer to Cornell because I thought I would then get to learn about plant-based nutrition, which was unfortunately not the case, but I switched my major to nutritional sciences. Uh, okay, so now you're, you graduate Cornell and then what happens? Yeah, I graduate Cornell. And so me and my friend, Jesse, we were in the same boat at Cornell. We had both transferred there to meet Dr. Colin Campbell. And so we sought him out. We connected with him in Ithaca, New York, and we got to be quite close with him. And so we really confided in him and asked, what should we go on to do? How can we propel this movement? And what's needed in this movement? What can we contribute? And he then um, yeah, listened to us and knew we were determined. And so he connected us with uh, Plant Peer Communities, a nonprofit organization founded by Nelson Campbell. And Jody Cass was the executive director at the time. And she was very excited to learn that there were two new college graduates who were looking for a job. And so she signed us up immediately. We were brought into the Plant Peer Communities team from very early on days. and. That was then our full-time job after we graduated. And okay. I still work for Plant Peer Communities now, uh, almost well, four and a half years later. So wow. it's, yeah, it's been great. great. So now, and how did you end up in the Netherlands? <laughs> yeah, so I graduated my bachelor's in 2017, worked for Plant Peer Communities, spent some time in New Zealand and Australia. And then I've always had the desire to live in Europe, um, being very international, and Europe was always a, a far away exciting place to live with lots of countries in one place, which is very different from at least living in Australia. So that was my desire to get to Europe, and I, I thought a student visa for me is the easiest way to mm -hmm. be able to live in a country for a longer period of time. So that was the reason I then started looking in Europe for a master's program. I knew I wanted to master in nutrition and the Netherlands speaks a lot of English. So I needed English speaking and I visited the Netherlands for the first time in 2018. And I fell in love with the bikes, the bike life, the sustainable uh, attitude in general. It's a relatively very progressive country. And yeah, it was clear to me that that's where I would come to then study. So I found Wageningen University. It's a very good food and agricultural university and they had the best nutrition master's program in the country. So I applied there, got in, and that's where I've ended up. So tell us a little bit about how you're studying and what you're studying and what you're hoping to see after that. Yeah, so I've mastered in nutrition and health and Wageningen does have a relatively holistic view on everything so they really prioritize sustainability and health um, their motto is for quality of life so they are open to plant-based diets they really do encourage people to eat less meat we have about three meatless days on campus a week in the cafeteria so they're 
really on top of that meets a problem. It doesn't need to be completely eliminated necessarily, but they are definitely on board with reducing meat consumption. Uh, all the masters are also very in line with the sustainable development goals. So for me, I focused on good health and well-being and climate action um, within my studies and learned more about food systems and sustainable food systems. And yeah, also how to do clinical studies with nutrition and what else? I took a nutrition and cancer course. That was great. On the second day of that class, they mentioned plant-based diets. So I was oh, wow. impressed from the beginning. Yes. <laughs> it took two years at Cornell to hear plant-based diets mentioned once in my class. Wow. And I wow. heard it on the second day here. So I knew I was wow. in the right place. So tell us a little bit about the life in the Netherlands, because a lot of us, um, well, you know, the United States is similar to Australia. We're kind of over here, <laughs> they're yeah. over there, um, and you're way down there. So what, tell us a little bit about the life of day-to-day -day living in the Netherlands and how you compare that to somewhere like the U.S. Maybe we're not yeah. quite so sustainable uh, living. No, well, the, the things that stand out are they have a great public transport system over mm. here. I can get all over the country by trains and buses. It's very efficient. Um, I love the public transport system here. So that's a huge plus. And otherwise we ride our bikes. Like I ride my bike 10 minutes to campus every day. There's bike lanes on every road. Um, bikes get the right of way most often in the road. So all car drivers are very conscious of the bikes. It doesn't feel unsafe. And so it's a more active lifestyle, I think. People ride their bikes every day. And even the claim to fame here in the Netherlands is that the prime minister rides his bike to work every day. So there's also not as much of a hierarchical society. Everyone's seen as more equal. So we call our professors by our first names. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, prime minister rides his bike to work. So that's that feels very inclusive. Um, and relatively, the country is very progressive. When I first visited the university, I noticed that they had compost or like organic waste bins on campus everywhere. So wow. everyone sorts their trash. And yeah, the, I mean, Wageningen is a special little sustainability bubble, but the Netherlands does have a more progressive, sustainable attitude than what I felt in the US. And mm. even in even Boston, so which has a pretty decent uh, transportation, well, for the most of the city anyway, maybe not the outlying yeah. areas, but. Yeah, not in, we're in the suburbs outside of Boston, so yeah, we're yeah. neglected, yeah. Yeah, no, I love Boston. I'm going back in April, going to go visit Emily, so <laughs> it's like. It is a great anytime, city. <laughs> yes, anytime we can go. We were in October, and now I'm going back again, so. Um, well, fantastic, and so the the studies now, and you're kind of winding down in your studies, what are you planning on doing because you know maybe there's other young people listening or maybe people who know someone what is your your uh, you know advice you know you got advice yeah. uh from Dr. T. Colin Campbell himself and he plugged you into a you know obviously a plant-based organization who's doing amazing work what is your thoughts and suggestions for those who may not be able to do that but to, to yeah. kind of move this moving moving train forward even faster yeah, well, I guess I'm going to take a step back and just reflect on my master's thesis, um, mm -hmm. which is in line with my advice. So I was very determined um, if I was going to spend six months on a thesis, I wanted to work on something I was really interested in. And so me and my friend here, Ava, we decided we would create our own thesis. And so we created an online course uh, called Plant-Based Diets, Food for a Sustainable Future. So it was sort of a literature review and we made a course out of it, which is free online, accessible to everyone, offered through our university. So that would be part of my advice is really do what you love. I, I never felt like I wanted to just fit into the mainstream path and take a box and do a thesis just because I needed to do it. I wanted something tangible. I wanted to make a difference. I didn't want to read or write an 100 page thesis report that no one was going to read. So that's why we, we came to the idea, let's actually make a course, a six week course. We filmed videos, we have text, we pulled from other resources. So it's a more engaging final product. Um, awesome. So that would be, yeah, part of my advice is really just 
do what you want to do. Like, even if that means creating your own path, uh, I've been doing that since I took my gap year and my bachelor's, which in the U S it's gap years, aren't really that common, let alone in the middle of a four-year degree. And yeah, I think reach out and, and make connections with people, um, ask for help and advice from people who are doing something along the lines of what you wanted to do. Um, I also have a piece of advice from Dr. Greger that's stuck with me. And I arranged a book tour for him uh, at Cornell. Jesse and I asked him like, yeah, we were asking him also, what can we do with our career? How do we propel this movement? And he, he just told us that, well, yeah, follow your path, but you've got to get at the low hanging fruit. There's going to be a lot of people who are resistant to the plant-based movement and don't feel like you need to bang your head into a wall trying to convince them that they should be eating this way. Go work with the people who actually are a bit more open-minded to this. Maybe they've had a heart attack and they're ready to have this major dietary shift. Maybe they have sick parents and they're really eager to learn. So yeah, don't tire yourself out because it does feel like a, an endless battle trying to save the planet, change the world, make people understand that plant-based eating is very important. And yeah, so I think, yeah, prioritize yourself. And it's like the oxygen mask analogy on the plane. Mm -hmm. Like you've got to take care of yourself before you can take care of other people on the planet. And mm -hmm. so find something that really speaks to you. And yeah, and online work these days is, is very present as well. So that's been a huge plus for me being able to work online. I've worked through my master's living here for plant peer communities and just, yeah, think out of the box. <laughs> No, I like that because you're, you built your own path and it's been very rewarding and exciting. So uh, talk to us a little bit about the thesis. Is it available for the public now and where can they find it if it is? Yes, it is available for the public. It's on a platform okay. called edX. Um, okay. I don't know if I can either send you the link or it's titled yes. Plant-Based Diets, Food for a Sustainable Future. We did all the uh, search engine optimization. So it is the first thing that comes up on Google if you type in that title. And so you type in plant-based nutrition for a sustainable future? Plant-based diets, plant food diet. for a sustainable future. Foods for a, okay, gotcha. And then if you yeah. can send me the link, I'll put it in the little show notes too. So. Yeah, that's great. Awesome. Yeah. Okay, so now what are you going to do? You're finishing up and what's the future hold for Ella? Yeah, so I'm, Finishing up with my master's, I'm almost done. I'm going to take one more course where I'm going to write a research proposal. And yeah, the next thing I'm interested in is looking into a PhD. I would love to do plant-based clinical nutrition studies. So like mm. what we did in North Carolina, take people who are sick, who have chronic diseases, who are on a lifelong prescription of medications and and just educate them through the dietary change, mm. take the before and after blood work like we did, and really get into the literature and the science that food is the most powerful option we have, more right. effective than a lot of the prescription or all of the prescription medications that people take. And I just want that message to be shared loud and clear because I fear that people are not taught how to take charge of their own health. We're not empowered to live a lifestyle that doesn't lead to heart disease or type 2 diabetes in the middle of our life. And as we both know, it, it doesn't have to be like that. So I want to show people that, yeah, they really can make such a big difference in their quality of life, their mental health, their physical health through a plant-based dietary pattern. Absolutely. So that is wonderful. And, you know, Without going into, I know we don't want to go into a lot of the details about the documentary, but it was very fun and successful. <laughs> Just lay yeah. that out there. What was the what was the impact for you? What do you feel like you got, you took away from that experience? Yeah, well, personally for me, it really reiterated how passionate I am about plant based diets. Even mm -hmm. though it was a lot of work in ten days at this house and leading up to it, mm -hmm. you know, I worked twelve hour days. I was so motivated to just keep going and continue. And so, yeah, it really reiterated that if you really are passionate about something, you can put in a lot of work. And so that's, mm -hmm. that was the motivation then for a PhD. It confirmed, okay, a PhD is a lot of work, but I know how, <laughs> how passionate I am about it. So I mm -hmm. do believe I could do a 
plant or a PhD uh, on a plant-based topic. And yeah, it was also, I felt really, what's the word, not inspired. I felt really motivated and excited to watch our participants who we were working with to see their lives change, to be able to see them walk more than they had in years or feel better than they had since high school. Like mm -hmm. it just, even though I already eat a plant-based diet, it just really reiterated how life-changing this dietary pattern is even in 10 days. and. So it just gives me additional motivation to share it as far and wide as possible and watch people take charge and of their health and change their life. I continue to do so because um, I'm still in touch with them and three, four months later, they're still doing fabulous. So yes, they're really hooked. Fun. We got them hooked. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Uh, well, I was a, a joint effort between Kim and uh, everyone who is cooking and it's just yeah, Fernando was amazing as well. I've interviewed him too on here. It's yeah. just, uh, it's been a lot of fun to plug into that community and, and see what the work that they're doing. So that's fabulous. So I think it's pretty awesome. Is there any other final words of advice? Cause you know, you're young and what would you say to these older millennial generation because you're not you're kind of on the cusp of that you're the millennial and then there's the z so i think i've got yeah. the generational thing right but i am a millennial you say? <laughs> i will stick to that name um yeah i think my advice that i've really learned for myself is uh, i often feel really down about the current state of the climate emergency or the current state of the chronic disease epidemic and i've really learned that yeah, that I, no, what am I trying to say? Um, what would you speak to someone who's in your age that's kind of in that same feeling, right? Because I mean, this is kind of a tough situation. You've got COVID, you've got the climate crisis being confronting their face. They've got all these things swirling around them. You know, young people are getting sicker sooner. Yeah what would be the first thing you would come to mind that you would want to speak to someone who's like, you know, what's the point? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I've been there too. And it does feel very overwhelming, but I like to remind myself that big change doesn't happen overnight. We are seeing mm. this plant-based movement take off and I do get some comfort in knowing that I do everything I can to try to help this movement. I choose to eat a plant-based dietary pattern for my own health, for the planet and also to inspire other people to learn more about this way and to show them how easy it can be and how tasty. And so I think, yeah, trying not to get too down about the huge picture that does seem very grim and gloomy and how are we gonna get out of this and just take it one day at a time and do what you can to make a difference. And I love the ripple effect as we call it. Like since I've become plant-based, I can't even tell you how many people in my life have either adopted a plant-based diet or a vegetarian diet or know how to now make plant-based recipes when I come over for dinner. And so just my own personal journey has already changed so many people's lives around me. And that's without going onto a large scale career yet, where I hope to speak more publicly about this and reach hundreds or thousands of people. So I think there is a lot to say from this bottom-up change, which I do at my job at Plant Peer Communities. That was also the theme of this course I made for my thesis. Uh, and as people like me might know, the top-down change isn't really happening, not quickly at least, not fast enough. And so I do then enjoy getting to try this bottom-up change and just speaking to individuals, even in the grocery store, like in North Carolina, I, was able to tell quite a few of the <laughs> grocery store workers about what we were doing and plant-based diets or found a lady on the walk and told yeah. her all about it. And her dog. <laughs> yes. And her dog. <laughs> so uh, just bit by bit. And, and we're going to do this, right? I like yeah. to look at it positively. We don't have a choice and it might feel like we're up against a very steep hill, but change is happening. And there are passionate people out there who really want to make a difference. And I think awareness and education is a great place to start. And that's at least where I see myself fitting into the movement in the future. Well, it makes complete sense. 
And I should ask one final question because I'm sure that's swirling around in some people's head. What do you eat on a daily basis and oh. how is how much insulin are you using and how has that affected you with your insulin use? I of should course. ask Vest that. That's the specifics yeah. that people are looking for. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I guess a, a daily recap of my diet. I love here in Europe, we are very lucky to have this brand called All Pro. They make the best plant-based yogurts. Uh, so I usually either have a coconut yogurt or a soy yogurt for breakfast with chia seeds, berries, frozen berries, uh, or different types of fruit, maybe a mandarin, a banana. You know, I love the fruit. Um, that's breakfast. And then lunch is usually leftovers because I'm still a student. So I can't say I spend that much time in the kitchen or I try to minimize it. But yeah, what do we have? I made a, was, we had a special dinner this week for my friend who was leaving and I made a vegetarian meat pie so we had the soy curl pieces and veggie broth and yeah that's an exception um i guess yeah usually i always like to have brown rice in the fridge and maybe some roasted root vegetables make a little salad tahini dressing <laughs> and then yeah dinner i eat a lot of grains a lot of starchy vegetables um yeah what else <laughs> well, <laughs> it's hard to recall yeah no right so you know because the soups and the, the chilies and the wraps like today i'm gonna make chickpea salad um you can put it in a wrap you can put it in a salad um we made a, a barley split pea veggie soup that lasted a few days i put a can of cooked soybeans already in it to add up to the soy you know me and soy um <laughs> Yeah, so those things are the things that we're eating and they're all, I have veggie burgers the other night. So yeah, there's some amazing yummy food. So what have you seen with the impact with your blood sugar? Um, Cause now I know you're using the CGM too. So you can really uh, monitor how things are looking. Yeah, Laurie got me onto the freestyle Libra <laughs> and it's great, life-changing. Um, but yes, I relatively take a low dose of insulin and since turning plant-based at least really notice that my blood sugars were much more stable throughout the day. Definitely still have the highs and lows, but it wasn't as um, difficult to kind of get them under control. They seem to regulate themselves much easier. And yeah, my insulin also has uh, just dropped dramatically over the last now, I guess like 10 years, I've really just watched it decrease. And at least as Laurie's told me before, I uh, I'm on just a normal metabolic dose of insulin. So my insulin sensitivity is high and not insulin resistant. So that's great. And that's made such a difference. And yeah, even yeah. one unit, unit of Lantus was <laughs> negatively impacting me as Lori saw. Yeah, no. <laughs> yeah, we, well, we all went to and lived <laughs> within the Campbells for 10, 12 days. And, uh, eating super duper clean. So there was no going out to eat. There's no oil and act, you know, people are active doing stuff. And uh, yeah, you're, <laughs> even then I was like, are you okay? Get, we had like, we need to pull back on some insulin. <laughs> yeah, it was it, just even a one unit made a big, big difference for you. Oh my gosh. Yeah, super sensitive. Mm -hmm. So, and the walking, I also do oh, my yeah. 10,000 steps a day and that yeah. is a lifesaver with um the oh. blood sugars and managing them and yeah going out for a walk after a meal so and you're also a professional like disc golfer yes I love disc golf we better put that in there <laughs> I like to compete I hope to represent the Netherlands in a competition wow. so wow yeah very cool now that'll be definitely another thing we'll need to talk to like Will you probably be the first plant-based professional disc golfer? Or do you know others? <laughs> no. Oh, no. Eagle McMahon. There is a, oh. a guy who eats vegan. Yeah. And he's on the pro level. So. Okay. Will him. you be the first female? Yep. There you go. We'll move Paved it that away. way. <laughs> There's nutrition, disc golf, and diabetes. <laughs> Which is a that's pretty unique combination. So awesome. Well, Ella, thank you for joining us. This was amazing. I'm sure you'll be an inspiration for lots of younger viewers and listeners. And, you know, share this with anyone, guys, that you might uh, find one, the course that Ella created. This is coming from a younger generation. It's not like the old folks up here, um, but this is coming from someone like you. If you have young people in your life that 
you think would be open to hearing this message, share it as a good resource and um, we'll help Ella kickstart her next step in her career. So I'm excited to hear where it goes. Yes. Well, thank you, Laurie. It's been great speaking with you. And yeah, I hope people find inspiration in this and my story. And if you find me online, feel free to reach out, ask any questions. I'm yeah, always happy yeah. to help guide someone in a different direction. Where can we find you online if people want to reach out social media? Yeah, uh, well, Plant Peer Communities, Instagram. Should I, do I give my personal one? It's up to what? you. It's whatever you like, to, wherever you like to connect. Do you want people to connect on Plant Pure? It's up to you. If anyone. Yeah, well, you can find my work on Plant Pure Communities. Uh, otherwise, I'm Ella Stevens. I think my Instagram is Ella Fant, like, the, like an elephant, E L L A P H A N T 94. Uh, awesome. So you can send me a message there and of course, follow me 94. for some plant base. Yeah. 94. <laughs> my year. <laughs> Your year. That's <laughs> so fun. All right, guys, have a great day and thanks for listening. We'll see you next time. Thanks for watching and I hope you enjoyed that video. Before you go though, please hit the subscribe button and the alert button so you will be notified whenever we upload any new videos. On Monday, we upload the Healthy Human Revolution podcast. Now, if you'd rather listen to the podcast, you can find it on all the major platforms such as iTunes, Google Play, SoundCloud, and even Spotify. Now, if you're looking for more resources on how to start a plant-based diet, sustain a plant-based diet, exercise, recipes, anything regarding wellness, we've got you covered. Check out HealthyHumanRevolution.com. And again, thanks for watching.